Well, hello and welcome to the February 5th, 2023 online message from Christian Fellowship Church. Christian Fellowship Church is located in Northwest Indiana. Our contact information is at the end of this video. Hammond, Indiana is where our church is specifically. We consider ourselves Hammond's Bible Church. And if you're in the area, please use that contact information to come find our service hours, find where our exact location is, and come and be a part of our worship as we teach God's Word week in and week out. We are going through a series regarding our prior year 2022 planning uh, meetings, and I hope you are finding these very, very fruitful. We're going to start in the book of 1 Corinthians here in a bit. Ultimately, our text will be John 17. So have your Bibles ready. Looking forward to an exciting study in God's Word. I'm going to first transition into the music ministry and then come back and have your Bibles ready. God bless. All right. Well, that isn't the way to start out a service. I don't know how else it is, so amen to that. Let's stand and let's join the song again.
Please open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. That is the text of scripture that we're going to start with. It's where we did leave off last week, but ultimately we're going to be in John chapter 17 for our first point, and we're going to see that we're going to be doing a topical message over the next two weeks in this video and next week's video, as we will specifically be in John 17, 3, Starting a study of knowing God. That's the theme of the message. My message is about knowing God. And if I digress, the reason I'm talking about that is because we had our series of planning meetings last year. And out of our planning sessions, we came up with a new vision statement, a new mission statement, different goals, different objectives, different... Um, our, Define values, if you will. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think we radically changed anything in our church. We're Hammond's Bible Church. We've always tried and strived to do things by the Word of God. But I believe what we're, we have accomplished is a better definition of where we're going, what we're all about at Christian Fellowship Church. And so I'm really excited about what the planning committee has produced. And... As we've begun 2023, I have been giving a series of topical messages that I believe, I believe, convey the very essence of what we're trying to achieve. And so what I'd like to do in this message this week and next week is talk about our vision statement and the concept of knowing God. Our vision statement, our new refined vision statement says to know Jesus and make him known in our communities and among the nations and we're going to talk about I believe one of the most important topics in all the Bible and so it's a good opportunity I'd say good day for you to be here because I'm going to show you why knowing God is so important and why such a claim is not an overstatement and I hope to present the material well and if I don't it doesn't make the subject matter any less important because it is important um, we're going to talk about knowing God. And if you're unfamiliar with this concept, you might be saying, well, why is it so important? Well, that's part of what I am working hard to try to convey to you why this is so important. Uh, when I went and did even a topical review, I found at least over 50 verses that deal directly with knowing God and more so even dealing with the knowledge of God. Now, when you talk about the subject matter of knowledge, a big word that maybe you don't always throw around, is epistemology. It's the theology of, of knowledge and information. How do we get it? So much of our message is going to deal with this because when you talk about knowing God, you're talking about the knowledge of God and knowing God. And what I wanted to do was give you a series of verses that I'm not going to ask you to turn to. You might just want to jot down the reference. These aren't even our primary verses, but these are verses that really espouse the idea of knowing God and the importance of knowledge of God. And I want to give these to you in a sense of a sensory overload <laughs> with intent that if you could just pick up and hear the concept of knowledge or knowing God in verse after verse after verse that maybe you start to say, wow, I can't believe that this is mentioned so often in scripture. So let me just give you a few verses and just listen, all right? Uh, now, if you want to write it down, Psalm 100, verse 3, it says, Know that the Lord himself is God, and is he who has made us, and we, not, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. There's a sense of a declaration. This is a piece of information you're to know. Know that the Lord himself is God. This is for Israel, but I think it's a truth that goes out to the entire world. Know that the Lord himself is God. It's a stated fact. You are to know this. It is a declaration that runs throughout the Bible. Know God. Have knowledge of God. Unbelievers do not know God. When Jesus is near the end of his life, 
he recognizes about that he is going to be persecuted. His followers are going to be persecuted. And he says this in John chapter 16, verse 3. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. Unbelievers don't know, have a knowledge of God. And they say, well, I know that God exists, but it's, uh, we're going to see it's deal, dealing with a relationship. Proverbs 10.9 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When you have knowledge, you know who God is, you have understanding, understanding of life. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Church of Colossae, says, for this reason, since the day we heard of it, their faith, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled, what? With the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's verse 9. And then in verse 10, he says, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And as we're going to bear this out, having knowledge deals with the relationship. And the more you know, the more you have a deeper relationship with God. It's not just going to be intellectual knowledge. Peter says, as he begins this, this, this is his last epistle, grace and peace be multiplied to you in what? The knowledge of God and our Lord, Jesus our Lord. And so when you have the Apostle Paul describe the incredible plan of God as he works through salvation in the book of Romans in chapters 1 to 8, God's plan for Israel in 9 to 11 as it works into the, the, I think, even the plans for the Gentiles. As he comes to the end of it, and he says in verse 33, Romans 11, verse 33 says, Oh, the depth and riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, unfathomable his ways. It's an incredible praise when he comes to the recognition of God's knowledge. And then, as the Apostle Paul prays for the church, he says, speaking of our goal, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So it's an aspect of maturity when you have this knowledge, this full knowledge. And maturity, remember, is dealing with completion, so that everything there that is supposed to be there is in place. So you have a ripe apple. Every aspect of the apple's development is there. Well, you know, for us, what do we mean when we're talking about becoming a mature individual? Um, let's say, and I used this illustration recently at the Wednesday Bible study, you know, there's 15 attributes of love. And love is patient, love is kind, not jealous, doesn't brag. If you have all those attributes down, then you're mature. You've got all 15 in place. But if I said, said to somebody, well, you know, I'm really good at 14 out of the 15, but I'm not a very patient person. Well, then I'm not mature. I'm not complete. That's what we're getting at. So with this knowledge, we are going to be mature when we get all the level that God wants us to have. And it's interesting, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 9, he writes, the Apostle Paul writes, by now you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God. And it's fascinating because then you can go down the path of election. How is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved by all over again? So he's rebuking them in regards to their lack of precision in application regarding their theology because they were demanding circumcision uh, like the Judaizers wanted them to, so that they would become full Christians. And that's a lie, <clears throat> because that's not the gospel. Okay, So how, but he goes, if you've come to know God, or be known by God, how do you do this? So we're going to see this idea of knowing God is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. J.I. Packer's book is a book I would tell you that is out there, it's called Knowing God. Lots of people have read about it. I'm not as crazy about it because maybe it gets a little deeper theology, but it is a, a book that if you're interested into it, um, knowing that you got to remember J.I. Packer comes from a covenant theology background, but the idea of, of his theology, uh, his doctrines that he writes about knowing God are pretty solid, and so I think it would be a beneficial book uh, if you're interested in this. So step back. What is the vision statement of Christian Fellowship? To know God um, and specifically know Jesus and make him known in our communities and among the nations. Obviously, we hold that Jesus is God. So 
We want to know God. We want to know Jesus. And we are not going to put a list of verses on our mission statement on our, or our vision statement because there are so many that are tied to it. And I hate for anyone to be limited to that. But out of this, obviously, um, these, these two statements, the vision statement and the mission statement, we are very much rooted in theology that's tied to the scriptures. And hopefully you've already seen that in our mission statement. I gave a sermon at the end of November on this. And now as we come into our vision statement, I'm hoping that you see that it too is rooted in the word of God. Now, again, vision statement, know Jesus, make him known in our communities among the nations. Our mission statement to glorify God by making disciples by the power of the gospel of Christ. Now, here's the kicker. It's the mission statement that gets the gospel out that gets to the end goal. What's the end goal? Knowing God, having a relationship with him. And it's critical that we remember the importance of getting the gospel out. And this is where we were last week, and I'm not going to go into much detail. I thought about it. But I do want you to remember 1 Corinthians 15, where the Apostle Paul says in verses 1 to 4, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Remember, gospel means good news which I preach to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which you are saved, saved um, from not knowing God, saved from hell, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, and belief is the heart of how we obtain this, for I deliver to you as of first importance. And again, how I can't emphasize the critical understanding of first importance. This is a top priority, a top priority, because it's without... It's only by the gospel that you can get to know Jesus. You can't have a relationship with Jesus. But as I'm trying to emphasize, and without diminishing the gospel, is the gospel isn't the end the, the product. The, the, the gospel is the channel to which we know Jesus Christ. We know God. So we have to have this down. And we have to have the truths of Verses 1 to 4. So verse 3 continues on. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, if you weren't here, I would encourage you to go back. Um, if you didn't hear uh, our message last week, you didn't watch the video, I'd encourage you to go back and look at the the in-depth study that we did on the five topics of the gospel. And I point out on the hand, you should always um, have these down. Because if you understand these five topics, then you understand a lot of theology. So you have man's sin, and you have the person of Christ, he's God in man, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection, faith alone. And how all the different subtopics and the verses all throughout the Bible tie in to those five topics and it's only by you coming to recognize you're a sinner that your sin separates you from God that you can't fix the problem because you understand how bad sin is and the penalty is your death physical and spiritual death the only answer is the, the second point of the gospel the person of Christ he's God and man his death was a substitutionary atonement meaning he paid for you. Like if you owed a fine and I paid that fine for you, I can do that. We have a legal system that allows that. God does too. And he allowed Jesus to pay the penalty. We know the penalty was received because Jesus was resurrected. So the penalty payment was received. And the word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, because Jesus was resurrected, everyone who believes in him would have, is going to have a resurrection. That's the hope. And so when we present the gospel, as I've stated, so many people often in presenting the gospel forget to bring up the hope, the hope of the resurrection. And then fifth, faith alone. The fact that you could not be baptized, get earn um, good works, <coughs> points, so that all of a sudden you are considered someone worthy to go to heaven. No, your trust has to be in Jesus Christ alone. So when you do that and you become born again, you become a believer, you enter into a relationship where now you know God. And when we talk about knowing God, there are two Greek words that are critical if we're going to look at the idea of knowing God. And 
they're going to both deal with this aspect of knowledge. And when I say that I know God or I know Jesus, that it, it is out of a relationship that both of these words play a part in. And I'm, I'll explain that. But first, let me illustrate it. If someone says, I, um, I know God. What are we talking about? I know Jesus. Well, we have an experience with Jesus and we have absolute facts about Jesus. And so when I have a relationship with someone on earth and let, let's say somebody like that's very prominent in your life, whether it's a mother or father, then just pick out a mother. If somebody came up to you and said, I saw your mother at the store today and I looked at them quizzically and I said, you did? Well, my mother is not in the area. She, you know, she's on a vacation. She's in another country right now. How did you, how did you see my mother? And he goes, well, yeah, I saw her. And, and, and I said, well, describe her. And, you know, oh, she was this tall woman. Well, my mother's a short woman. You know, oh, I saw this was a, a blonde haired woman. Oh, but my mother's a brunette. Um, this woman was wearing glasses. Well, my mother doesn't wear glasses. So all of a sudden I start to say, well, do you even know who my mother is? You don't have a real good understanding of who she is. And, you know, the person comes and says, well, I had a hard time talking to her because she only knows, um, she only knows French. Well, my mother knows English. My mother's in Eng from, from America. So obviously you don't know my mother. You don't know. You don't have a, a relationship with my mother. You have a knowledge of my mother. So these uh, concepts are what we're trying to get you to understand. With this person, obviously, we wish I could show you Jesus and there was a visible manifestation of him. But as Jesus in and himself says in the Gospel of John, blessed are those who believe yet don't see. So yet I want you to be able to say I have a relationship with this individual, Jesus. And so the two key Greek words that are at the heart of this concept are, are the Greek words gnosko and oida. And I'm going to show you these in the three key verses that we're going to talk about. Gnosko is a word that is used in different forms, verb and noun, throughout the New Testament Greek that deals with a knowledge through experience. All right. So the more I get to know you, the more I experience you, the more knowledge I have about you, then I have this gnosko kind of knowledge. Oida <coughs> is the idea of absolute knowledge. Two plus two equals four. Uh, but it's not just like mathematical knowledge. I know that I'm married. I know that I'm an Indiana resident. I know that I was born in Ohio. These are facts you can't change and in the sense that um, they are absolute. Now, I can move to um, Kentucky and say, now, I would say I used to live in Indiana. That's a fact, okay? So it's an absolute fact. So my point is it's kind of fascinating how God will use these two different Greek words who at times can be somewhat interchangeable. You'll, you'll see that. But I truly believe at very key times the, the choice of the of specific Greek word is chosen to convey what kind of information is at heart here. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go through three key passages that are going to talk about why knowing God is foundation to everything important in life. Get that? I'll say it again. Knowing God and knowing which Jesus is foundational to everything important in life. All right? And so when we come to um, um, John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus says this, okay? And he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So <laughs> I just put knowing God, but obviously in our vision statement, we have knowing Jesus, and, and we want to keep that, you know, brief you don't want a vision statement just rambles on and on and on so this is my explanation when we talk about knowing God we talk about knowing Jesus so to me they're interchangeable but obviously in this passage it's talking about God the Father God the Son and here's the here's the point this verse on the last night of his life as Jesus is getting ready to get killed the next day and he's laying out this great prayer it's called the high priestly prayer in John 17 he lays out certain truths, and there's many truths in this passage, but I just want to focus on this. 
as he prays, he says, this is life, eternal life, life that lasts forever. What do you mean? I thought life was going to be like on the clouds or I'm going to be in heaven or whatever. Well, the very essence of what eternal life is, is that they may know you. And which Greek word is used here? Gnosko. Have an ongoing experiential relationship with the only true God. And I, one commentator said, as he, Jesus mentions, there is, a, is not a pluralism. We've been studying this concept in our Sunday school with America, how America has allowed pluralism in religion. But when it comes to ultimately the reality of eternality, there's only one God. And Buddha and all the Hindu gods and all the different variations of gods throughout the different religious systems, we're not coexisting. There's only one true God, and it's the God of the Bible, the God who is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he says, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So this is eternal life. And this idea of knowing God is an eternal relationship. Um, one commentator from the Bible Knowledge commentator, Commentary, Edwin Blum, says, Eternal life is defined here by Jesus. It involves the experience of knowing the only true God. It is a personal relationship of intimacy, which is continuous and dynamic. The word gnoskin here is in the present tense. It is often used in the Septuagint in the Greek Testament to describe the intimacy of sexual relationship. And this is the first time I'm mentioning it, but I got to tell you, you cannot study the concept of knowing God without someone bringing up that concept. That the word knowledge was, was used for the first sexual experience recorded in the scriptures. You got that? And, and it was from the, even the Hebrew word <coughs> for knowledge back in Genesis chapter 4. And the idea is, is that the sexual relationship is the most intimate form of relationship that a two human beings can exchange and the idea of getting to know them on a level that nobody else is going to get to know your spouse that's the goal right and the idea here then is there's a reason why this word is used for sexual relationships as well as relationships with God and the idea is is that there's an intimacy there's a relationship so when we talk about the fact that Christianity is a relationship and not just the religion, and I always digress because sometimes you'll say, oh, you know, Christianity is a good religion. So I'll be like, oh, no, 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 Christianity is a relationship. It's a relationship. It's not a religion. Well, you know, in a sense of general discussion, it is one of the various religions out there. So I, I, I again, digress. The idea is, is that we have to understand, though, that it is at the heart of it, though, really a relationship. And this isn't something that we're imposing on our concept of, of religion. It is the very heart of what God communicates over and over and over. And this word here of knowing conveys that very thought. This is why I put on your sheets, you can fill in the blank, this shows knowing God is an eternal relationship, a relationship that goes on forever. That's what we have here. You know, people come and go in your life and even if you're married for 60, 70, 80 years, maybe one time one of, your, one of the spouses is going to die. It's going to terminate. And that relationship is over. Um, I told Becky, though, we can be friends in heaven. You can come clean my mansion. You know, ha, ha, ha. No, I, I would hope that I could get to hang out with Becky. But the reality of it is, the reality of it is, and I even digress even further in the sense, my relationship with Becky has grown. I couldn't imagine life without her. I don't know how eternity would work out. Not obviously, I have to love Jesus. He has to be premier in my life. But you understand what I'm saying, and I hope everyone that has a marriage would have to would say the exact same thing. And so, there, it's an eternal relationship. I don't. We don't know how relationships on Earth are going to continue on for eternity. But the reality of it is, is the relationship we have with God, the relationship we have with Jesus, is an eternal one. And so when we look at this, eternal life refers to the quality of life and not just the quantity of life, John MacArthur says. It is much more than living forever. It is enjoying intimate fellowship with God both now and forever. It cannot be reduced merely to endless existence since the unredeemed in hell will also live forever. 
because they have eternal life as well. Eternal life is a quality of life. It's not only a future possession, but a present reality. In John 5, 24, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and doesn't come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. And these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life, he writes in 1 John. So believers enjoy eternal life even now as they experience the rich blessings that come through personal and intimate relationship. So it's a relationship. And I want to expound upon that. And this is where we're stopping at this point, but I, I have more to say elaborating on this point. This comes out of my doctrinal studies, comes out of a book that I've been trying to work on out of uh, 1 John. I'd like you to turn to the book of 1 John chapter 1. This is a book about knowing the genuine from faith, what is genuine uh, in a relationship with God. And, and I just want to show you that when we come and we start talking about a relationship, we talk about knowing God, there are going to be other key words that are tied to this. And one of the key words is the idea of fellowship. The word fellowship means partnership. It's an agreement. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, John says, What we've seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that, our, that you too may have what fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So we, we want to know the Father, we want to know Jesus, okay? And so focusing on in our mission statement with the idea of knowing Jesus because He's at the heart of the gospel, but this is part of our knowing God, all right? So John says these things we write so that our joy be made complete. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about the fact that the reality of the gospel is something that's true, something they can know because they, they have... They have man seen it, manifested it, they've heard it, they've felt it. Um, we've seen with our eyes, we've looked, we've touched. Verse 1 is talking about it all results in this thing called fellowship. And fellowship talks about a relationship. It's a partnership. I think believe in first in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, um, the fishing agreement that Peter and John have together is called a partnership it's a it, it, it is a union it's a, a marriage is a fellowship it's a partnership it's an agreement it, it's not just uh, um, the fact that we go down and eat a meal together it's more than that there's a, a level of commitment and where am I going with this is that I want you to understand the doctrine of knowing is now now all through the book of first John and, and I'm not going to go through the oidas and the gnoscos here, but I just want to read a series of passages, and I want you to pick up on this because John knows if you're going to have fellowship, you're going to know God. You're going to know God. And I just want you to read these with me. This I'm not going to put these on the screen on a Sunday morning, but these are ones that I'm hoping that you'll listen to, and you'll see it, and you'll just maybe even underline or highlight if you use a phone or a tablet for your your Bible reading, I know you can highlight things. The word know. Look at how often it appears. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And um, it says, By this we what? Know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. And the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know we are in him. No, no, no. By our obedience, by the love that's practiced, we have knowledge. We have knowledge that we are in fellowship. And this is information that God wants you to have. You jump down to verse um, 20 in chapter 2, as John has told us not to love the world and to recognize there's false teachers in the world who are going to try and pull us to the world. And he says in verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. Everyone who's a believer has the Holy Spirit in them, who's guiding them and directing them. But listen to what he says. And you all know. There's a reality. You say, well, that's subjective, right? But it's true inside. You know if the Holy Spirit's in you. Verse 21, I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. You know it. There's a reality. If I said to you, Jesus is not God, you would say, no, that's not true. I know. I know he's God. All right? And you know why is of the truth. Jump down to verse 1 of chapter 3. See what great love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, and such as we are. For this reason, the world does not what know us. Remember, I alluded to earlier that believers, we know God, the, the believers know God. Unbelievers don't know God. 
So he says, for this reason, the world doesn't know us because it doesn't know him. Because, beloved, now we are children of God. And as I appeared, what we will be, we, we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. We know because we're sure of the fact that Jesus is going to return again. And we know our behavior indicates we are children of God. You go down to verse 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. You know this. These are facts that you know. Verses 18 and 19. Little children, let us not love with word or deed with, or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him. The idea of knowledge is something that God wants us to have, knowing who we are positionally, that we are in him. And then in verse 2 of chapter 4, he says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is from God. Spiritual leading is doctrinally tied. You've got to always remember that. It's doctrinally tied. And, and so he goes into this idea of how do we know when we're being led doctrinally, spiritually. It's tied to our doctrine. Um, verse 6, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. We, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The us there is the apostles and the truth they've laid out. I can not manipulate that and say, oh, you better listen to the pastor Mike or the, you know, you're out. The, the, the context here is the truth of, from our apostles that have laid down the truth and they've given us the word of God. They've given us the New Testament. And obviously as a pastor teaches that and espouses that, it is, should be along the same lines as the truth of what they, they taught. But look, the heart of it is the true believers listen to God's word. And then you jump down to verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God. So love becomes part of that experiential aspect um, of how you have confidence whether you are a Christian or not. Verse 16. We have come to know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. What do you mean? We've come to know it. We, we come and have this knowledge of Jesus dying on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins, and the way then, he, as we become believers and live out our life, he operates in our life. And then you come down to verse 13 of chapter 15, um, chapter 5, <coughs> perhaps one of the most famous verses in all the Bible. Excuse me. Verse 13, 1, Corinthians, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. And it doesn't end there. And we're, you know, future studies, we're going to talk about the significance of that verse. But giving assurance of salvation is critical. And assurance that shows you that you are in the fellowship. Um, and then because we have this, we look in verse 5, 15, and it says, And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. And so what you have here is, a very detailed, very, very detailed explanation of the fact that um, God has basically made it really, really clear that he cares for us and that he wants us to know that he will answer our prayers. And then finally, as the book ends up in verses 19 and 20, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So what do you have here is all of this is out of the book of 1 John that's talking about the relationship, the fellowship that we have, and how knowledge, epistemology, plays a part in it. Your gnosko, your oida, your information that you're going to see plays out doctrinally, plays out, um, plays out in practice, that gives you this idea that you have a relationship with God the Father and God the Son. So our goal here is to make Jesus known, all right? We want to make Jesus known so that people know him, in essence, know God. And so the question then is, how is your knowledge of God? Do you know that you're saved? Do you know you have a relationship with the eternal God? Do you have a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ? Because for our perspective, we want people to know God. And praying is an experiential aspect of it. Um, it's not just academic. Reading God's word and having it conform to your life is experiential. 
but there's also just the knowledge of knowing what right doctrine is, that there's only one God, there's only one way of salvation. And the salvation message is that man's a sinner, that Jesus is God and man, he died on the cross, he resurrected, faith alone. So, my hope is that you can look at your life and say, I have a relationship with God. And, I, and, and the more you study his word, the more you put it into practice, that knowledge grows. And if you find yourself lacking in that knowledge, it's either because you have to start off at square one and come to faith, or you need to get going and reading more and living out and being the doer that James talks about. So God bless, and I hope that this message has helped you in your pursuit of knowing God.